Welcome to the Best Music Podcast. My name is Dan the Music Man, and this week's featured guest is Will Greenstreet. Will Greenstreet played guitar in the Australian band Doug Parkinson and Focus and composed the soundtrack score for the 1974 cult classic biker movie Stone under the name Billy Green before traveling to the States. Stateside, he wrote a music study book called Fourth Obsession and has released numerous CDs, singles, collaborations, and projects. Will has played solo saxophone at the top of the Empire State Building for over a decade. Will, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, Dan. Um, You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) So, Will, a couple warm-ups. Do you have a piece of music you've listened to over the past couple days that's really sparked your interest and sort of caught your eye? No, nothing, uh, you know, uh, nothing out of the ordinary. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm i constantly checking out everything. Mm. Well, what's uh, on? And that, and that can be anything from Kiss FM to John Coltrane at his best. <laughs> right? So I just check out. I always have been this way. I check out everything. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's something you pass along to me. For many people listening to this podcast, you may not know, I actually studied saxophone with you from the age of, oh, I don't know, maybe 11 to 18 at school. Yeah. And maybe your open-mindedness towards all genres of music is something that translated in the lessons because I, I, I feel the same way. It's like, if it's music and it's good, I'm into it. Like genre, genre doesn't matter that much. Yeah, that's uh, you know that's that's the truth of it. It is music, and uh, uh, it's all music, and it's uh, it's either good, badly executed, or really well executed. That's kind of where it's at. You know, I can hear really great country music, I can hear really great jazz, and I've heard ba- bad on both departments too. You know, so uh, you know you just shy away from the bad stuff. You know, so. For you, Will, what would be the difference for you between a good and a bad musical experience? Would that be the feeling that the music gives you? Would it be the technical ability of the players? What's what's giving you that that discernment between good and bad? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. It's uh, it's both, really, because you know the music has to have some kind of a soul living feeling to it you know for me uh for me to vibe with you know like if i relate to the music if i feel like yeah i like this and then i might think about those aspects later i might go well is it is it where it's coming from the genre yeah is it because it's bebop or whatever or it's smooth or whatever uh uh or is it uh because it's uh excellent excellently executed you know really well played uh, i would analyze that later but usually i'm just attracted to music if it really speaks to me and that's the soul of the music i would say you know so it seems like when you're appreciating a piece of music there's a two-step process the first step process is the first step of the process is does it hit you in the feelings like are, are you feeling the music and then exactly. after that comes a sort of intellectual analysis. Oh, I like what he's doing over this chord, or I like what she's doing here. That sort of cerebral musician stuff we can all get into. Yeah, and it goes even further than that because if I really like it, I'll try to understand it in some way. Uh, you know, the thing that I've been doing for years is really like understand what it is that I'm hearing. So if I hear a line that I really like, uh, then I try to figure out, okay, so what is it in terms of like, how could I go to my instrument and play that line? So I would think in terms of intervals, you know? So uh, you're, you're reverse stuff. engineering it from a jazz perspective saying, okay, what are the notes that are being used? What is the chord or underlying harmony underneath? How do those notes relate to themselves how do the no- those notes relate to the chord? And then how does the whole ecosystem come together musically? You're sort of figuring out the puzzle pieces. 
Right. And and actually, uh, I didn't really think of it, that it was just a jazz process, but, you know, but uh, jazz players do tend to think in terms of numbers. And I didn't know, like, what I did even way back, like, before I even had any access to numbers, uh, I just used my ears for so many years of playing guitar before I even realized that you can think in terms of numbers. Uh, so then it was all to do with ears, like what uh, what am I hearing? And then, you know, like I would learn so much stuff, like Chet Atkins records, I'd put them on and actually go, wow, I want to learn this and just listen and put the needle back and put the needle back and get it down and try to figure out where he's playing it. So that's developing the ears, the ability to hear, right? So, and that can now be, I feel like I just did this the other day. I was hearing Miles Davis play. He's going, and then I hear Wayne Shorter directly afterwards doing his solo, and then Herbie Hancock did it too. Right. And that was so beautiful because I understood what Miles was doing because. I could see the pattern, I could visualize the pattern, and on what part of the scale he was starting to do that. And then whatever you did after that, like he'd change it all the time. But that's the way he would start his phrase, you see? So that's how my ears have developed now, is to where I hear a phrase that I really like, I want it. I want to know what it is. And then I went in the studio that night and practiced it. And I'm practicing in 12 keys. <laughs> <laughs> I put it into the blues. You know, I have fun with it, with understanding something I love, you know. And we'll definitely get into your practice mentality a little later on. But the, the standard that you set in terms of understanding a single concept, like you said, sort of your, your MO is to take something you want to understand throw it into 12 keys and beyond just getting a cerebral understanding of it, getting a visceral understanding of it and actually applying it and playing with it and what it feels like when you do it. And I've, I've seen you take just one idea like this and not only put it into 12 keys, but then I've seen you arpeggiate it. I've seen you harmonize it to flip it around to do every possible thing to it. Every sort of inversion, retrograde, this, that, and the other, all those fancy musical terms for just changing it around. And really, like you said, your, your thing is understanding the idea to such a deep, deep level that it then can become part of you and be, can become part of your language. Uh, you say that so well, Dan. You said it. <laughs> you said it perfectly. But that's exactly uh, the concept of really good improvisation is based exactly on what you said. You know, really taking any idea that you hear, uh, and and you can hear it as it's happening when you're playing with other musicians. You hear somebody play something, and you you are having a conversation, like thinking in terms of. Wow, what did he just say? Wow. And then you respond by by being in the same pocket somehow, rather rhythmically or tonally, and being that open also. Of course, you gotta get your chops together. Always you have your chops, uh, you know, chops, your skills on your instrument, uh, have your ears wide open and really thinking in that concept of uh well, I am playing with this person and we're having a conversation you know and and that gets that gets really amazing when you're playing with two or three people and everybody has got great ideas so you might pick up a beat you pick up a bass riff you pick up a, a trumpet line or a keyboard line uh, those things that you know you have to be you know i feel like uh it's like blinkity blink, you know, you're just really on the edge, like a butterfly. You're right on the edge listening, right? I think what's interesting about this idea of 
music being a conversation and needing to really, like you said, be right on the edge, or as I would say, right on the ball, you need to be like right, right there, super hyper-focused, but also in the moment. It's a very meditative place to be, right? Because it's sort of like, you need to be able to be in the moment, sometimes audiating, so hearing the notes you're gonna play before you play them, but also at the same time, not trying to project or direct the music, but trying to go with the global theme flow of what's happening. And I think what's really interesting is to look at that context within different genres. So like if we look at a jazz trio versus a blues trio, we're still going to see that conversation happen, but in a different way. Right. Right. There is, a, say, like in a blues genre, uh, there's a standard sound and there's a standard feeling yes. and the standard form. Everything about it is you don't jump outside of that. And I've actually experienced jumping outside of that live on stage in Austin. I hopped up with a blues band and I said, damn it, I'm just going to play exactly the way I want. And I'd just been jamming with this drummer and I was feeling so free. I said, yeah, I can do anything I want. And I did. And the musicians started walking off the stage. See, that's uh, that. And I don't blame them because that was not the form that they're uh, subscribed to on stage there and what they love and all that. So who's this guy thinking he can come in here and just make a noise, you know? So the blues is a very definite, uh, you know, uh, okay, Martin Banks, who was my neighbor in Austin, a great trumpet player who played with everybody from James Brown to to, uh, to Sun Ra and all that. He said, the blues is not a scale, it's a feeling, mm. right? And we've had discussions about that, and it's both. You know, you don't play the blues on a C scale. You know, you can't do it. It doesn't sound any good. <laughs> you know, it's just like it's the wrong notes, you know. So you have to have the, the notes under your fingers, and then it's all feeling after that. Yeah, I was just talking to um, the amazing uh, microtonal and non-microtonal guitarist, uh, Dave Fujinski, Fuse. I don't know if you're familiar with them, Screaming Headless Torsos. Uh, anyway, he was talking about how the feeling of Jimi Hendrix getting bends. And even when we go and copy note for note, the feel it's a different feeling, man. It's like yeah. to get to get that feeling. Oh, we can yeah. copy it note for note, but that feeling is a whole nother ball ballgame. Yeah, you're not inside Jimi Hendrix's uh, soul, you know, mm. and love him, you know, it, it, you know, all of that helps for you to understand what he's doing. But it's kind of an understand thing rather than, you know, you can't live his life because his life is, is tremendously complicated, like where he came from and where he went. The beautiful stuff he did behind his voice on Little Wing, mm. right? That stuff, the two two note chord things that are just they're delicious, you know. They're really like they show what kind of a musician he really was. And most people, when they're talking about Jimi Hendrix, they're thinking of clashing two notes together and going through a wah or whatever, you know. It's yeah, it's probably like he could create a lot of sound and play really loud and do all of that, but he was a fine musician. Indeed. Uh, and I think bringing back, just to finish my point on the blues versus jazz, I think what I was talking about in terms of the conversation being different is that when we're playing jazz, it's a three-person conversation. And while someone may solo at a given time, there may be a band leader who we're going to follow for form and you know we're going to take emotional cues from them, this, that, and the other. There's a little bit more of an equality feeling in terms of your voice being heard when you're playing jazz. It's really the sum of all the parts. Whereas if you watch a great guitar player like Buddy Guy, for example, take a solo and you watch his band, the band is entirely focused on Buddy. And as he brings the solo up, the entire band mirrors that and crescendos up with him. And when he brings a solo back and drops it back, the whole band drops it back. So the musical conversation happens. It's just, it's a different conversation using a different language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. So uh, Buddy Guy would be the focused person and the whole band has agreed that this is what we're doing. We're supporting, exactly. 
Yeah. It's like he's Aretha Franklin. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. That voice, you know, you're not going to cover up or answer anything that he's doing. You're just really supporting him, you know? Yeah, exactly. Whereas in a trio of jazz, we say you consider like your equal members and uh, like say how you would play when you're alone would be one thing. But then when you have the drums and the bass there giving you ideas, uh, then you can play how you play and they make you feel comfortable and you make them feel comfortable by supporting. Like, in other words, you don't cover the bass player up. Right. You know, you don't uh, outsmart the drummer with rhythms, right? You allow the drummer to feed your rhythms and you allow the bass player to direct you on what part of the, the sounds you are you know, like if he's really leaning in a certain direction, you go there with him, you know, and really support it. And conversely, you can propose rhythmic ideas and you can propose uh, harmonic and melodic movements. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I have this experience, I just have to tell you about it because this is exactly what we're talking about. When I'm making, uh, when I'm recording uh, by myself at home and I make the whole band track, I write the piece of music coming from a line that I've written and then I harmonize it and then I create the drum track and I create all the, the whole chordal scene and complementary scene and what the bass is doing. And I build the solo as I'm already thinking, like when I get to about the second solo, the third solo, I'm going to be in this department and I'm going to be this intense. I'm, this is what's going to happen. And so I make the band already be answering what I haven't even done yet. Right. It's a really it's an incredible experience. And I make it work to such a point that where you are listening to it later on, even I listen to it, I go wow, that band is really onto what the sax player is playing, you know? So it's really cool. So over years, you can learn how to do that. Just build it in the right way, you know? And then also, you know, in a recording, you have this opportunity to say, nah, I didn't like what the keyboard player was playing there under my solo. I'm going to change it, right? And so you can do that. Where in real life, you don't do that. It's just like... This is why live recordings are absolutely the best because they're honest, right? They're not manipulated. Well, sometimes. In the modern context, however, there's overdubs, redoing parts in live recordings all the time. So I guess it depends on the genre and it depends on the musicians and management and all sorts of other factors. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So like, for example, in a pop live performance, Let's say the the live auto tune that the singer's singing with, uh, or and and again, this is not knocking pop music. I'm just saying that you you get a particular sound uh, from auto tune that is it's used artistically. Um, let's say the live auto tune goes out and you can hear the singer singing a little flat. They're not going to release that. They're going to go back into the studio, pull that track out, go in, redub it, and then put a reverb on it that makes it sound like the room. And yeah. there's there's your live recording. You know, uh, and that's interesting because I was just uh, remembering that a singer that I work with a lot in Australia, he's still going, Doug Parkinson. He told me that the scene in Australia is so bad now in the recording business is that if a new singer comes along and wants to present uh uh, a product like you know here's my song and here's my production to a record company or a, pr a promoter or anything like that they won't even listen to it unless it's being auto-tuned now that that really disgusted him but the, you know i mean and he's not a person who sings out of tune you know he really feels like you know you either have the gift to do this or you don't or maybe you should get out of the business or whatever it's del it's delicate you know because you want the finest product you can present but at the same time you want it to be honest you know? well that's a very interesting conversation to have will because are you saying that by this statement and again i'm, I'm not attacking you this is this is just sort of for argument's sake is the thought process then, well, if you're not naturally gifted and talented or if you've not put in the years of effort to develop your craft to that point where you can execute technically on what you're being asked to do precisely, that 
you should go home and shed? Well, it's partially that, but no, yeah. what I'm really saying is that if the standard in the business is that I can't present my product to a record company unless my voice has been auto-tuned, because they won't even listen to it, and it hasn't been auto-tuned, now we're not going to listen to it. You but know? can't we say the same thing at a certain point, record companies wouldn't listen to a song if it didn't have a guitar solo, then record companies wouldn't listen to a song if it had a guitar solo, then record right. companies wouldn't listen to us wouldn't listen to a song if it had synthesizers, then they would only listen to a song if it had synthesizers. So these things go in and out of fashion, don't they? It's it is a fashion. It's also a criterion that they set against uh, the artist. I think you know the artist should be able to do whatever they want. So here is my product. You know, listen to it. If they won't listen to it, unless you know that's a that's a, they're, you know they're putting a they're putting a a criterion on it. You know. But by definition, I assume we're talking about pop music, correct? Because we're not we're not talking about jazz vocalists needing auto tune. We're talking about pop pop musicians needing auto tune, yeah, that's right? Probably what we're talking about. Right. And I know so little about it to tell you the truth because I don't even listen to that much to it, you know. But I think by definition, pop music has achieved its purpose if it is popular. Could you agree with me on that? Like the whole point of pop music is to be popular. The whole right. point of pop music is to sell records. So right. I'd if, like to be popular. <laughs> well, well, all you got to do is break out that auto tune and we've got some opportunities for you. There you go. <laughs> so if, if by that definition, it would make sense that the companies would limit the sound to be auto tuned because that's what the consumer is expecting that's what the consumer's ear has been taught to expect from a pop song so if you're trying to sell records so you're not trying to rock fact, the boat yeah, yeah so uh you know my son morgan uh made me aware that in the world uh there's probably three or four top producers making this music we're talking about which is pop music and and uh it's set to such a standard now that uh uh, you know, like say someone has the song and they find the singer and they produce a backtrack and they make it sound a certain way and uh, and everything is uh, manipulated to a point where, wow, you listen to that production, I can hear echoes turning into this and listen to how deep the bass is and wow, and, and the bass drum is driving right out of my little speaker. It's hard to believe, you know. So they all sound very similar. That's what I said to him. And he said the reason why is because most of it is produced by the same three or four producers. And they're the top guys that can get these sounds that are guaranteed hit. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's interesting, but I think the same thing can be said. Interestingly enough, we, there's all these historical comparisons. Like, let's look at the Wrecking Crew, the session musicians out of L.A., who played on so many records. And while we could argue that like, we can compare uh, good vibrations from the Beach Boys that they played on to almost any other song and say, okay, those sound radically different. I yeah. think I think the principle remains the same because, you know, it's music business, 50 percent music, 50 percent business, because it's the business. Those sort of laws of capitalism or rules of capitalism are always going to apply and we're always going to go for the top talent or people who have a proven record. And then that's yeah. going to result in exactly what you said. A lot of things are going to sound similar because you have the same person with the same feeling who also wants the same paycheck again. So they're recreating to a certain degree the success they had before. It's just like the Marvel movies. They're great. They're awesome. But they all feel a little bit the same. You, yeah, you have a hero. The hero fights a villain. The hero overcomes the villain. The hero wins the day. Yeah, there's a formula. There's a formula. Right. You right. Know, and it's interesting that you bring up good vibrations because that is really one of my favorite songs of all time. Uh, not only from the song's standpoint, the musical standpoint, but the sound and what they created with the cellos and uh, and these and they're using the Thurman, like that's 
you know, those that was eerie. That was so freaking beautiful, you know. And I knew that wasn't the Beach Boys. That wasn't the Beach Boys doing <laughs> playing those tracks, you know, because they were tight and it was arranged and it was, you know, it was beautiful, you know. So, and you know, as I was uh, a session musician in Australia for a good amount of time, I think about four years, I was in the studio uh, playing on people's hits. You know, so then I got the feeling of what that was like. You know, the artist wants the best band, and they may even have standard musicians that they perform with, uh, but they weren't going to get these session musicians to go out and perform with them because they're getting their they're earning their living in a studio. You know, next session, next session. You know, and that that was the business. You know, but I really appreciated that song as. Well, wow, that's a beautiful standard. But also, they were trying to keep up with the Beatles. And the Beatles, uh, you know, had all the help under the sun with George Martin and, and their brilliant engineer. Uh, you know, Jeff these Emmerich. people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they could get anything, almost anything, right? And they developed so much in those in the short time that they were together from the crudest first recordings where they're rough, you know, but they're beautiful, raw, soulful to where they got so refined and they got sick of each other. They didn't want to play with each other anymore. You know, it's like, get out of my face, you know, a funny Beatles story about trying to find different sounds. At one point, John Lennon was, uh, tripping on certain illicit substances and he wanted to get Jeff Emmerich to tie him to the ceiling by a rope around his waist and swing him around in circles around a microphone to try and get the feeling of a pan going around in stereo image. <laughs> oh, but of course, of course, like everyone distracted John. So eventually he forgot about it and they didn't have to hang him from the ceiling and <laughs> spin him around on a microphone. There was one song, I think, in uh, uh, All Across the Universe where he's actually being fed through a, a Leslie speaker box, right? Where the speaker is spinning. Oh. Yeah, it's going through. Oh. Uh. So they did use the spinning speaker, but I love your story. That's beautiful. So you mentioned uh, this great singer you used to play with, Doug Parkinson. Uh, you guys were in a band called Doug Parkinson in Focus, uh, mm -hmm. where you played guitar. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what that experience was like? And I knew when I was still living with my mother, you know, when I was still living at home, and he was just living... Uh, three or four suburbs away from me and he was singing in a band called strings and things and he wanted to come and audition in our band uh, we were in a band called the questions and we were playing we had a regular gig in a hotel in manly along the beach uh so can we, we actually pause there will and unpack what you just said because for us mm -hmm. nowadays that concept is a little strange so you had a regular gig in a hotel so this was back in the day where not only could you have a regular gig in a hotel and by mm -hmm. regular you mean you were playing there like every night or three nights a week or something like that uh six nights a week and saturday afternoon okay so at this period in time just to take everyone back so they can understand the context the number of bands were smaller there were fewer bands out there and there were many more performance opportunities that were paid so like six nights a week in a hotel it really wasn't a question of okay i need to go practice my instrument for 10 years and then i'm going to get a gig it was i'm going to learn my instrument while i'm out gigging while i'm out playing on the stage is going to be part of the learning process as it is still to this day but to a different degree and so you guys would be out playing six, seven nights a week, but not only playing six, seven nights, sometimes playing multiple gigs per night. So you'd have two, three, four shows that you could play in a single day, and you're doing that multiple times a week. So making a living as a musician was a completely different proposition than what it is today. Yeah, I totally, yeah. I, I'm sorry for rushing by that, and you know, because... It's just a memory in my mind, but it's uh, but it's phenomenal what was happening in those days. 
where you know the the thing was there were a lot of bands but there were a lot of pubs in australia or hotels you know pubs there was you know you could have there was a pub on every corner or something it's a very australian thing that it, there were lots of pubs and uh, so w- what was happening in those pubs they'd have a, a bar and they'd have a ladies lounge Right, they if somebody got wise and actually put music in a ladies' lounge, and then the ladies started dancing, and the guys came in from the pub. You know what I mean? They came in from the bar, and so then it became like, wow, all the all the pubs wanted to have bands. So we lucked out at that time because uh, my young years was playing in you know maybe six or seven pubs I played in over a period of 10 years, you know, uh, and they were all regular gigs. So they would hire you to play as much as possible for the least amount of money, uh, you know, but you would be, you'd leave all your equipment set up, you know, for guitar players and drummers. That's fantastic, right? Just leave it there. The PA's there. You just walk in every night and do your performance, three hours, two and a half hours or something. And to and, unpack what uh, you just said right there for people to appreciate that normally yeah. at a gig, if you're a drummer, number one, you need a minivan or like a sprinter. You, you need a, a large car or a friend with a large car to transport yeah. your entire drum kit, even when it's broken down. Yeah. Then you need to spend half hour to an hour setting the drum kit up. <laughs> then you play the gig for three to four hours. Then you yeah. spend another hour or half hour breaking the drum kit down, putting it back in your car and driving home. So. The prospect of leaving a drum kit set up for even a couple of days is so many hours and effort saved that anyone will jump at that. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we never broke it down because we just leave it there for Sunday. We come back on Monday. You know, it's like that, you know. And not only that, but we used to rehearse there as well. You could wow. go to the place wow. in the afternoon and rehearse two or three new songs from the from the hit parade or whatever and get them together and play them that night, try them out, you know. So, yeah, that was a lucky time uh, for us. So, so Doug Parkinson, he said, can, uh, can I uh, come over to your place? I want to teach you a couple of songs, uh, a couple of tunes uh, that I want to sing uh, in, in the Talent Quest, on your Talent Quest on Wednesday night at this particular hotel that we were working so a talent quest is going to be like a battle of the bands or an open mic. It's like an open mic contest, sort of. Yeah, open mic contest, exactly. So we had it every Wednesday night uh, in this pub that we played at, and uh, all kinds of people would come, and it was always like the winner would be voted by cheering, by the cheering crowd. Really, that's what it was. You know, the band didn't have a say in it. You could just see. So I, I learned, uh, you know, with Doug, he taught me, Sonny, Sonny, thank you for the love you gave to me, you know, so hey, he's got this voice, you know, he's got this beautiful, rich voice, you know, and we, he also did uh, Mustang Sally, right, so we learned those two things, and I really love playing with him at home, and, you know, so, and he could tell that, like, we locked in together, uh, so he came on that Wednesday night and there were about 10 performers and he was by far the, the best, you know, there's no doubt in my mind. What happened was Doug didn't win that contest. You know, the girl won the contest and, um, quite rightly so, I suppose, you know, but Doug got the gig in the band. So that's where we started playing with Doug. And that's when it stopped being the questions you know, it became uh, it became a Doug Parkinson in focus. Then there was a big transition from there. But that was the beginning of it. Doug and I were very tight and we're still very tight now. And he's still going. He's still performing, you know. Wow. It's amazing, you know. He's a real trooper. You know, he's gone out. He goes on the road. It's amazing, uh, you know, at his age, you know. Uh, it's great. He's he loves the music and he's a great singer, you know. So during this period, you also uh, get hooked up with the Stone movie. So just Stone, S-T-O-N-E, Stone movie, uh, which is a cult classic biker film. 
、um, that even Quentin Tarantino has talked about how much he likes Stone. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to get in touch with、uh, Quentin because I thought, well, if you like that, you should hear what I can do now, you know, music wise, because he really liked the music track. Uh, and I thought that I could do some music for him at some point, but he's impossible to reach. Like、oh, anyone,、sure. yeah. he's static. You know, you can't get to them. You know, so hopefully he'll listen to this podcast and say, "Where are you?" <laughs> hey, Quinn, if you're listening to this, so much respect. And this is Will, also known as Billy Green, who did the music <laughs> for Stone. So Yen, I I don't think I I did mention this in your intro, but、uh, during the time you're playing with Doug Parkinson, and now when you're、uh, writing Stone,、uh, the music for Stone, you're actually going under the name Billy Green. So if anyone's、uh, on Google right now, going, I can't find anything on Will Green Street Stone. That's because you had the stage name Billy Green, and that's the name that you did all of this stuff under. Uh, yeah, this is true because、uh, you know when I when I came from the Netherlands at age nine to Australia, and by the time I actually started playing music professionally at around age fifteen or so, sixteen, fifteen, sixteen, I started playing in bands. I couldn't really use my Dutch name, you know, because my Dutch name was such a mouthful、uh, that I. You know, I did a kind of a translation of it. You know,、uh, my Dutch name was Wilhelmus Anolis Maria Francis Groenewegen, so, so Wilhelmus is really William or Will or Billy. You know, and、um, so that seemed to fit quite well. And the last name、uh, Groenewegen, which really means Green Way or Green Street, most of my family took on the Green Way name.、Uh, I like Green Street better. It just sounded. I don't know. It just sounded more my style, and then、uh, and then so uh, uh, I just used Green in the beginning, Billy Green. I made it the shortest possible, going from the longest name possible. You know,、uh, so then I just used that name, Billy Green.、Uh, it was not legal. You well,、know? you know what? I think stat- statutes of limitations at this point. So you you you're under the name Billy Green, and how do you get the call? To make the movie for Stone. Okay, that's a、um, you know it, nearly every question you ask、uh, could be exploded、uh, because it's such a huge story, you know. And、uh, any time that I get into rants about this stuff, people usually say you should write a book. You know, the, the how I got to know Sandy Harbert is really what that was about. Sandy Harbert was、uh, the writer, director, producer of Stone. And、uh, and how I met him was my girlfriend at that time in、uh, in Melbourne was Isabel Morse, and she's a great violinist, a viola violist, has a whole family, very talented.、Uh, her sister plays、uh, cello beautifully, and then her their other sister Helen Morse was married to Sandy Harbert, and so、uh, I would very often、uh, be having. Uh, special dinners at the Morse House in Melbourne,、uh, right? My girlfriend's parents' house. They would invite, and they were very,、uh, they were a very cultured family. They had, you know, beautiful table and beautiful setting, and the greatest food and all that. And then there'd be, you know, scruffy me, Billy Green, coming right out of the rock. You know, I'd been playing gigs late at night, and I'd be like, like that, you know. And then Sandy Harbin and Helen, right? And they, so. And then Sandy was—he、um, was—he—he he was a very good actor, and he was had also been a lawyer and all that. He was a psychologist. He was really a fantastic human being, you know. And、uh, he was started working on this script, and he was saying over our dinner table at the Morses one day, he was saying, you know. I'm doing a movie, a, a biker movie, and I really want you to do the music, just like that. And I said, "Well, you know, hey Sandy, thank you, but you know, I've never done、uh, music for a movie. I play live on stage, you know. In fact, I know nothing about writing music and all that." He said, "Look, you've had hits. You've written hits, and you you're a rock and roller. You've got the feeling. You've got yeah." 
I want you to do the music. And I said, well, you know, I have no experience with it. He said, I don't care. He said, I, I want you to do it however you want to do it. And, and I'll give you the tools, whatever you need to do what I want you to do. And so I said, okay. So <laughs> it was just like, all right, if you're willing to work with me, you know, I'll work with you. It'd be a great experience. So over the course of a couple of years, we started meeting and he would read the script to me uh, of what he had. And he, he was still writing it. And then I would make notes and I would do drawings because I'm very visual kind of thinker. You know, so that's the way that I could remember it, too. And so uh, that's how we met. And we kept doing this. Every couple of months, he would come down from Sydney to Melbourne, and uh, we would meet, and uh, we would do that. And then eventually, uh, he said, you know, uh, we're ready to start shooting, and I want you to be a character. He gave me a motorbike, you know. He, he gave me a character name. I was called 69. We won't say any more about we're not, that. We're not unpacking that. <laughs> So anyway, but I had this beautiful Kawasaki was all painted. Everyone in, in the in the biker group had this beautiful Kawasaki painted to their character. And so then I was uh, shooting in the movie in Sydney for uh, maybe a good month. Uh, we were up there scenes every day where I was. I was not in every scene, but I was in a lot of scenes. I had a non-speaking part and I didn't need a speaking part. He wanted to involve me in the movie so that I get to understand all the characters and what the story was about and the personality of all the characters that I was going to write a theme for, a theme for every character. And so I did that. I had that whole experience and it was, there's much detail to that experience. There was nude swims and playing really late at night in a cave with the with with, a, with the camera panning around while I was playing and everyone smoking joints and all this stuff right there were really incredible experiences and then uh, I went back to Melbourne after that with all the split second timings of all the fight scenes the punches I, I took all the seconds you know I was in the editing office for Ah, you know, probably three days, you know, I went back to Melbourne and I wrote the score for a whole year. I went composing, you know, with a metronome, all that stuff, you know. So, but let's talk about this because at this point you're writing a score up until now, you've had a couple radio hits. You've had a couple top tens, I think even top fives in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, but all these songs you wrote, maybe the lyrics down and then you just played the chords for the guys in the band and then you would go perform the music so the amount of writing and notation involved would have been very little for these for these top 10 top five hits that you had right. but what we're looking at doing now is actually crafting an orchestral score so how do you go about communicating that yeah, that's a really good question, you know, because uh, because Sandy had given me this permission, uh, it was a beautiful thing because I I, uh, I just had to figure out what to do on my feet, like as I was going. So as I was writing, I needed a theme for this. I wrote all the themes and then uh, I would come up with the pieces and actually write out uh, the band charts and all that stuff. Just to learn how to do it, right? I just learned how to do it. But uh, when we think about writing out band charts, just let's just talk strings. You have yeah. violins reading treble clef. You have violas reading alto clef. You have mm -hmm. cellos and basses reading bass clef. So how did you learn about writing in different clefs and different registers for different instruments? Well, I'm more apt with that stuff right now, you know. <laughs> but back then, was... ha back then, how did you first learn about it? Okay, so this is how I dealt with that, is that I knew I wanted strings for that particular uh, funeral scene, like the big drive down the Gosford Freeway uh, of all the bikers with, the, with the, the casket and all that. And it was like no actual sound except music, you know. And I wanted, I wanted this beautiful string piece of music 
taking them all the way to the cemetery uh, where they stopped, and then it would turn into another piece of music. I wanted to segue that. So uh, how I wrote that piece of music, when I say write, you know, a lot of a lot of people these days, I wrote this song and I wrote that song and I go, did you actually write that down? Or are you, it's just language, you know? So how I wrote that string part was I bought a little, I found in a little uh, hawk shop, pawn shop on the corner of where I lived in, in Carlton, Melbourne, uh, they, they had this little pump organ. So you pedal maybe about two and a half octaves or maybe three. And on that, I composed the whole string part. And I composed it in the way that, you know, like as a composer, you play things until you you are playing what you want to hear. That's what I did. So, and then after I got it and I got it down on tape, I wrote out what I'd played, right? So I, I had that much. I was already playing session work. So I was reading to learn to read uh, charts and all that stuff, you know, uh, in studios. So I got I had a lot of experience with that. Um, then uh, and this, so I wrote out the part like that. And then I gave it to an arranger, Peter Jones. He was, and he was a musician that I worked with a lot in session work. He was actually a jazz piano player of the highest order. And he was an English teacher in high, in high school. He was an amazing person, very groovy piano player and great ears. And so, uh, and he happened to be conducting a lot of uh, commercials. You know, I worked with him a lot, and he kept hiring me because he could give me a blank chart. And when I say a blank chart, a chord chart, you know what that is—just a chord chart. From here to here, this is what we want to play. And then he'd allow me to make up my own parts in it. And he felt that that worked out a lot better than actually ever telling me what to play. right? Because I'd come up with ideas and they'd ask me to do overdubs and all that stuff without any further charts or anything, you know. So I hired him. I said, I want you, I want to have, I want to have the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra playing this, and I want you to arrange it so that. You know that it's completely complementary. Like all the all the uh, you know the bottom end goes to the right people, and the top end goes to the right people. And then even in the session, he was conducting that orchestra, and it had to fit. It had to go. It had to fit uh, in a certain distance and all that stuff. So I was actually behind the glass, directing him directly in his headphones, and uh, they were playing. And uh, and I would talk to him and say, you know, it's not quite the right feeling. You know, I want to get more compassion out of this piece of music. So they've got nothing but notes. But I want you to feed to them that this is a funeral scene. And uh, and you talk to them in the way that you can talk to them. And he could. He could talk to these. He was a jazz musician, but he could talk to uh, these classical musicians. You know, they're different. You know, they come from a different world. And. And so he talked to them in a way to get that feeling, to project that feeling, you know. And he was saying something about, you know, like, just think of this as your mother uh, had just died and this is her funeral and just give it that kind of feeling, like give it some passion. You know, this is right. He, I heard him talking to them like this. I thought I could never talk to them like that. You know, <laughs> they would laugh at me. Yeah. But anyway, he got the feeling out of them, and that was a beautiful thing. The only other classical instrument that I used in that score was a French horn. And that. He also. But he was an Australian, uh, and he played in the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, and he was a great artist. He was also known for his art. So, and I had him playing a solo piece. But he played to a background that I did on uh, a sustained guitar, like, you know, where a note just goes. And then I had a violinist playing with that as well. And he was sustaining a note. So the two of us were making out like it was Indian music, kind of. So, you know, that thing. And so he played this whole piece on French horn while he was listening to us doing that. And then at a certain point, we meet up. Right, so his thing was timed to such a thing where we meet up with his playing 
it was crafted, you know, I had to craft it. But he loved playing that piece of music. In fact, he said that piece of music, he took it to uh, the Philadelphia Philharmonic. Was it the Chicago Philharmonic? I forget. Anyway, but he took that and they put it in their repertoire. Oh, that's so cool. It's the music I wrote, right? So he loved it that much. And then he said, you know, if you write any more for the French horn, I want you to know this. There's a little lever here on the French horn. You can pull it. If you pull this lever, the whole instrument goes up a half step. And I said, wow. I mean, you could play like B.B. King on that. And he said, yeah. And so he showed me. He went, he did that on the French horn. Oh, that's fun. Okay, so French horn is an instrument that I think has never been exploited in the blues genre, but it should be, or in jazz or whatever. Like, it's an amazing instrument. So he was able to not just modulate up a half step, but he was able to get those microtonal bends so he could press the lever down halfway and get a microtonal bend? It's a pull. They pull this. It's just a little thing. Maybe it's pinky or whatever. It just pulls. One hand goes into the belt, right? Right. So I guess it's the left hand, I forget. But anyway, one hand does all the notation and the pulling of this lever, you know. Huh. So French horn is something that's uh, that impressed me. It has a big voice, too. It has a voice like a tenor sax, that big, you know, like really fills a room, you know. So that was, uh, that was the only classical writing that I wrote. Everything else was chord charts. And, uh, you know, I wrote some beats for the drummer. I worked with Graham Morgan, who was a drummer on all the tracks. And he just knew what to do all the time. He was fantastic. And uh, Big Goose, Barry Sullivan, was the bass player. Top, top guy. And he played by ear like I did. You know, we played by ear. Peter Jones did all the keyboard stuff, and he played by ear or music. He would play that kind of ear. You know, he is really one of that because he taught me about how important that is, you know. So the rest of the score just came together like that as tracks. I did hire a banjo player to come play part of it, and I... uh, I hired a guy who did all the synthesizer stuff, and I hired somebody who did a didgeridoo for a 15-minute track, and he blew he blew this didgeridoo for 15 minutes, and I was there to witness it. it was, he was phenomenal. He could get any sound out of this thing. And that's the corroboree, which is uh, – part of the movie where one of the characters is on acid, he's on LSD, and he's tripping out. And there's the Hare Krishna are there, and the police are there, and bike gangs are there, and a lot of people, and politicians. It's a public, it's in a public park, and uh, there's so much going on, and it's all there in that track, the 15-minute track I had to put together, you know. Do you have any other stories about Stone and writing the uh, writing the music for Stone you could share with us? Uh, I think the 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 interesting part to me was writing a piece of music for every character, which is a little bit like you, you know, as a writer uh, of music, you get into a frame of mind, right? You get you are in a frame of mind when you are writing a piece. You, you have this feeling, and that's the thing you're projecting. So, what what I had to do for every character in that movie was really get into that character, right? So, and it gave me the opportunity, I have to say, because. I'd never used it like that before. It was always my own feelings, you know, rather than, you know, a character. So there was that. And then the rest the rest of it was uh, incidental music, what they call incidental. So that's the stuff I had to have split-second timing on uh, <clears throat> so that, say, a fight scene, for example, outside of a, a hotel or pub, uh, as part of the scene where the two bike gangs meet and the fight, you know, somebody throws over a bike and it smashes on the ground. The greatest insult to a biker is, you know, to tip over their bike. So this big fight starts where somebody gets thrown onto a truck and there's punches and all that stuff. I got all those timings and I had to write. 
I had to remember everything that I had seen. And I had moved from Sydney to Melbourne, 600 miles south, to remember all that scene and then to write appropriately uh, in this, to record all this stuff with musicians, describe to them what's happening. Okay, this is where the guy tosses over the bike. This is where somebody punches this guy in the jaw and he ends up on the back of a truck and his girl comes and does this and all this stuff. So I was describing all that stuff to the musicians and it prints, you know, it's, it's printing. And uh, so it printed to tape and we recorded everything on 16 track uh, and then finalized it down to a stereo master. And then when it was done, I sent it to Sydney. And I sent it to Sandy Harvard and uh, they took it into the studio and matched it up to the movie. And he called me back and he said, you're a genius. You can, you can die now. <laughs> That's what he said. You can die now. So as far as Sandy was concerned, I'd done it. And, uh, you know, as far as I was concerned, it was, you know, it was a good achievement, but it was, I, I was anything but done. As you can see, I'm still going, and I'm 77 now, and I'm writing, you know, since this pandemic started, I've probably written a double album and recorded and arranged and actually written out in Sibelius every note. It's all there. You know, I've got it now. After the success of Stone, uh, you move to the United States, and you end up working in Austin, like you mentioned, and then later on in New York where you and I met. And during this period, uh, you continue to be a prolific recorder uh, and just putting out CDs and albums and collaborations. But you also publish a book called Fourth Obsession. So can you talk a little bit about this book? And we'll also, we'll have a link to it in the show notes so people can go check it out. Oh, beautiful. Uh, yeah, so uh, Fourth Obsession is... is is a truthful statement about something I discovered with the interval of the fourth, which is do da do da do da da da. You walk up four notes on any scale, well, on the major scale, and you get the fourth note. So if uh, so, if you go do da, and then what you do with that fourth? I love the sound of the fourth, you know. And why do I love the sound of the fourth? Because uh, because. Uh, it sits beautifully without saying anything. Resolve me anywhere, mm. right? So you add another fourth to it. If you go do 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 like that, uh, it makes the most beautiful sound, right? It's rich and it's watery and it's spatial. I got really, I got um. really attracted to the, to the sound of the fourth and. Uh, and it wasn't it wasn't a mere accident. Uh, it was uh, people like you know Debussy, uh, the French the French composers of the earliest uh, early 1900s, uh, really got into that sound. Satie, they really used it, uh, and they used it in such a beautiful way. You know, I was just thinking the other day that uh, people here, and I guess stemming from Europe, uh, they always talk about the cycle of fifths. To me, it's the cycle of fourths, and I always thought of it that way. You move, you move forward to the fourth and to the next fourth, to the next fourth. When you go back, do, 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 do. that to me, it's like, it seems like a dead end in sound. It tells it for me. But anyway, so, so then I started. So, Will, can we actually unpack that for a second? So I think what's, what's interesting to um, note, is that when we talk about the circle of fifths, or as you called it, the cycle of fifths, we're going from, let's say, C to G, uh, G to D, D to A, A to E. Now, if we go reverse order around the circle of fifths, we'll actually have the circle of fourths. So if we go C, then we go backwards, we'll go to F, we go backwards to B flat, yeah. we go backwards to E flat. And what's very interesting is that when we look at classical music and all eras of classical music, we're going to be going around the circle of fifths. Now, what gets to be very interesting is when we look at jazz music, because horns are in B flat and E flat, 
that way of exploring the reverse order of the circle of fifths or the circle of fourths can actually be a more uh, viable option in terms of creating, like you say, that there's a different sound and it's almost this warmer, um, softer feeling when we go around the circle of fourths and the circle of fifths. And also mm -hmm. unpacking one more thing like you were talking about, uh, this guitar is probably out of tune. So those with perfect pitch and anyone with ears, please forgive me. Uh, I don't have time to tune this, but um, this is gonna be a fourth. And then, so we have this first note and then we can take the second note and add another fourth on top of it. And then we can add another four, fourth on top of that. So we end up getting these stacked fourths, which we can call quartal, Q-U-A-R-T-A-L, quartal harmony. So what you're talking about doing with your book of fourths is really exploring this relationship of when we just start going through fourths and stacking fourths on top of each other and what that looks like when translated to any mm -hmm. instrument that can play single notes, such as the saxophone. Right. And especially uh, when you play single note instruments, that this is what I found on the guitar, uh, you're laying a finger flat, right? Mm. Because it's tuned in fourths, right? Except for the top two strings, you have to just well, do the, a little the, addition. Well, the, the G to B. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. So any, yeah, the G to B is, is what changes it, right? Because that's a third, yeah. So, um, this uh, fourth idea on a on a saxophone or on a keyboard um, leads you to you know like on a keyboard you're really spreading your fingers out to get these notes to come out and they have a beautiful sound in contained in them those chords like uh, that could be used for any kind of composition and for and once you have that in a composition then you tend to play on it as well because it has that sound right as opposed to doing the normal one three five seven nine kind of sound in your chords <clears throat> so um, so fourth is something that that really attracted me like one thing is like like on the saxophone, for example, there's a, there's a tremendous logic in uh, in playing fourths, the way that they link together, like different from the guitar where you lay your fingers flat, but it has a feeling like you're really going through your keys in a, in a beautiful spatial way uh, that really appealed to me. And so I, when I started exploring and listening to Wayne Shorter and Train and many other players who were really into using force in their composition, Miles, and everybody was, you know, Herbie Hancock, they were all really using those sounds and, uh, and using them so beautifully, and they appealed to me. So that's when my own learning is like if I came up with any idea at all, I just write it down in a book and I start practicing it, you know. And uh, and I taught it to some students, you know, but basically it was something that I was working on personally and building. So by the time some years had gone by, I'd filled about three books of ideas of fourths, right? And how I could keep, and because it's my nature, I keep, uh, I start off with a simple idea and I keep adding more to it, more to it and more to it. And, you know, and so I have to bring in at this juncture, the book, uh, that I wrote is not only about playing fourth, but it's also about cycles, about putting those fourth into cycles. And it's not just uh, fourth and uh, fifth cycles, but it's uh, chromatic and it's uh, it's whole step. It's minor third, major third, and fourths and fifths and all of that. So all those cycles, uh, in my opinion, are valid studies. They're really good studies. Um, in other words, when you play fourths uh, uh, cycling in minor thirds, it's uh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful sound. It's a beautiful sound, and that's what I've been concentrating on for the last couple of years. You know, but Far it's out. in my it's in my book. So I put it all in my book as, so that I could study it myself. You know, I got my thoughts together. The other part that I've added to it that's really, really important, and I've stressed this uh, as a teacher so much with my students, and you will remember uh, that we put everything that we practice into rhythms. 
In other words, any idea that you have at all, even if it's a lick that you got from somewhere, uh, somebody that you want to incorporate into your playing, what you do is you put those ideas into rhythm so that you change, you want to break it up. So you go, da, ba, do, da, da. You want right? You want all these rhythms, as many as you can gather, uh, to practice your ideas, your musical ideas, into uh, to keep changing your mind about how something sounds, because it can sound any way. You can make it sound so many different ways. Okay, so where did I get this idea from? I got it from almost the same week that I arrived in San Francisco from Australia. And uh, and I arrived on Washington's birthday, actually, which was really funny because everything was closed. <laughs> the, whole, the whole town of San Francisco was standing still. But then the next day I went to this music store and I was just going through and just looking to see what they had, you know. And in this music store, they actually had books, uh, music, uh, learning, teaching books. And they had this book that really grabbed my attention straight away. Uh, and to, to uh, put up front before I even tell you this, that in Australia, I heard McCoy Tyner play on a record and he was playing Dorian and he was so free on it. I was so impressed. It left such an impression on me. I said, I'm going to America. I want to hear McCoy Tyner. I want to hear him. And McCoy Tyner is the piano player that played with John Coltrane for years. A great, great musician. So anyway, I come across this book, and it was called The Dorian Scale. I mean, simply. And I can't even call it a book. It was like a booklet. It was about maybe 50 pages, very thin. And it was by Emil de Cosmo. Emil de Cosmo. And I opened it up and I thought, you know, this is going to be like really explaining this whole thing to me. You know, what is this Dorian scale? No, it just had a Dorian scale running up and then a Dorian scale running down. And then a fourth up, Dorian scale up, going down. Fourth up, Dorian scale going up, going down. So the whole page went through your 12 keys. Uh, halfway through. But critically, it, it, through the cycle of fourths, not through the cycle of fifths. So instead of yeah. writing C, G, D, we were writing C, F, B flat. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is Emil de Cosmo. He was a sax player and, and a great teacher in New Jersey. So he already got me started in going in those kinds of directions. You know, you go halfway in that direction, then he'd do it, you know, in, uh, instead of the scale going up, it'd be the scale going down, going to up. Right? Simple. Uh, for the rest, going through the same cycle again. On the opposite page, he had a whole page of rhythms. The rhythms that I'm still using now. And I taught it to you. And I taught it to all my students. And I've actually expanded the whole idea of these rhythms because now I make them more like syncopated rhythms, more jazzy. So instead of I make everything swing, right? Right. So, so to, you're not just making it more syncopated, you're actually changing the meter from yeah. a straight feeling to a swung yeah. feeling. Right. Instead of straight uh, straight eights, I make it like as if it's uh, coming off triplets, right? right? And then, you know, long, short, long, short, long, it has that kind of feeling. And so if you practice that stuff enough, it becomes your style. It becomes part of your style, you know. So I learned that from Emil de Cosmo. And to tell you the truth, I, I couldn't believe how much I learned out of that one book. And then I found he had lots of books, but the same principles apply, right? He used rhythms with a scale, right? And I, I saw on the book there, on that booklet, that there was an address and, a, and there was a phone number. You can't believe it. Like the guy put his phone number there. And I called and I left a message on his machine. I was living in, uh, 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 where was I? Uh, I was living in Rockland County at the time, you know, Cricket Town Road. And, and uh, I called him up and I left a message on his machine. I was saying, look, you know, you don't know me, but 
I've found, come across your book and I just totally love it. And I just wanted to thank you for putting it out. It's taught me a lot. He called me back and he invited me to his house. So Kat came and Morgan came. Morgan was a little baby. He was two. And we went down to his house and he was the most sweet guy. He took, us, he took me into his studio. He gave us lunch and all this stuff, but he took me into his studio and he had all these chairs and music stands set up where he could get all these people playing these crazy rhythmic ideas. You know, he was a great teacher. There's no doubt about that. So he infected me to the point where I used his rhythms and I acknowledged him uh, in my book. I, the rhythms are there in my latest version of the book where the book actually f has fold out back and front, you know, where all the rhythms are there on the fold outs rather than on every page, <clears throat> depending on what you're dealing with. And so the whole idea behind using these rhythms to kind of break it down from a pedagogical and also practical standpoint is that when you're playing a scale, it can be just that you're playing a scale, you're playing from the lowest note to the highest note back down. And the, the creative juices don't really get flowing when you're just going bum, 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 bum. But once you start adding in those rhythmic variations, it's like a first step in the door for improvisation because you're already changing up the way you're playing. It's going to say, okay, the scale, this is our framework. Now we're going to pull from this framework to create ideas. This is how we create ideas from the scale. So it's a really, really cool way of sort of starting people on the path to improvisation. Yeah, you, you're speaking my language. And this, this is really, really important for somebody who's really trying to bust out of the mold of being stuck in, you know, scale between, land. Yeah. yeah, scale land or, you know, just even form land, you know, because you know, if you listen to somebody like Miles Davis, you see that it's going jing 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 you have to breathe your phrase, otherwise you'll play endlessly. And a lot of guitar players. Uh, so, and uh, as a guitar player, I played guitar for say 23 years, <clears throat> a little bit beyond that. But basically, that's that was my period of time. Uh, I always had to really work on that: is to play in phrases, like really just think about space. You know, think about leaving the space. You know, between your phrases. Whereas on sax, it comes naturally because. You don't just circular breathe because you can do it, you know. You 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 play your phrases according to the breath that you have, you know. That was such a critical exercise that you had me do on the guitar, which was to not play when I was breathing. So you're like, okay, now you're going to go home and you're going to play. You, you had me playing over like some Abersold backing track or something. All right, you go home and play. Use your pentatonic scale, whatever makes you happy. But when you breathe in, you stop playing and that teaches you that yeah. teaches you oh okay so it's not just about sitting there and going a million notes a million uh notes an hour sometimes it is but it's also mm -hmm. about having that ability to use the space because it's not just about the notes it's about the space in between the notes mm -hmm. it's like if i served you a a five a three star michelin uh dinner on a uh on on a leaf or I just threw it on the ground, the context is not the same. You need the context of the silence to represent and present the notes in a way that gives them a value that they yeah. would not have otherwise. Exactly. Yeah, no, that, that was very well said. I have to interject here, though, because I don't remember teaching you guitar. I remember teaching you the sax. We had a couple lessons where okay. I, 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 had my, I had my mom paid a, a, a couple extra, like a, we either snuck it in on the weekends or something like that. There's a couple times I had my guitar with you. I remember being tremendously surprised when you said, I'm really a guitar player. And I said, no, Dan, you're a sax player because you're such a good sax player and you're a singer, right? So singing and sax uh, go hand in hand. I mean, I think one of the reasons I play the sax is because I want to be a singer, but I'm actually a much better 
singer through the horn, you know. So can you actually talk about this? Because you have a philosophy around different instruments pulling from different spiritual and physical areas. So you always talked about singing and the sax as being soul instruments and the guitar being a heart instrument. Can you go into that a little bit and explain your, your philosophy to people? Okay, that's that's really interesting that you bring that up because it's it's a feeling I have. I have no physical proof of it, of course, but when you play an acoustic instrument, especially acoustic guitar, and it's up against your body, and you feel that vibration. You feel the vibration of the guitar up against your chest, and you and you put your fingers, which are electric. You know, your fingers are full of electric, your own chi, right? And you pick those notes, and you feel that vibration that you're creating. Your heart finds it very agreeable, like it's uh, – uh, it. I always found that it made me feel really well, you know, it made my heart feel really good, that vibration, you know. And, of course, the other visualization around that, you could say Romeo and Juliet, you know, uh, Romeo Romeo having the guitar, you know. It's, it's like you can win a woman's heart with a guitar because that sound appeals to her heart, you know where any other instrument like, say, a sousaphone or, you know, <laughs> or, or a drum kit or something like that, it does not, you know. It doesn't. It oh. has that vibration, right? So it has that. The saxophone, because it comes directly from your voice and your whole spinal cord, you know, your whole bone structure is involved in the sax. You, your lung breathing, like I'm really, uh, really getting into Qigong lately with my wife, uh, we do practice Qigong nearly every day, and the breathing and how how you bring your breath and how you how it ties in with the physical uh, is is an extension of what I've been feeling with the sax for years. In fact, he even has this exercise where you bring all your breath up to the top in the top of your chest. And then you direct it all the way down to your gut without letting any of it out. And it's what I used to teach to get more air. Then you sink a rock on it and then you breathe in more. Right. So you've got this lung capacity like you wouldn't believe. You need a lung capacity like Cannonball Adley. You know, he's built big and he's got a sound that sounds like he's got a big bag pipe. pipe. You know, he's got a big bag that he can... He just lets the air out, and it just comes out, right? It's like that. You have to have a lot of air support. So, And then with the sax, because of that vibration, it goes right from your teeth through your, through your, uh, through your spinal cord, and it speaks your soul. It's like uh, the reason why I say that is because when you play the saxophone, you sound like you, and that's anybody who plays the saxophone sounds like them. They it sounds like it sounds just like the way I'm talking now. When you listen to me play the sax, uh, I play with the same tone and the same rhythmic uh, uh, feelings. It's really like it's my voice hmm. that I'm playing, right? So I can hear my own solos and go, "Yeah, I was talking really well that day. I was talking fluently, you know. I was expressing myself." And It's like oh, the guitar was like have I put the romantic feeling in this? Have I am I playing warmly? You know, what it's always about that kind of heart feeling, you know. Anyway, it's so, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a really interesting philosophy and a really interesting outlook because I think, uh, at least speaking for me personally, I had an inverse experience. The sax I was feeling as part of me, but it didn't quite feel like me, me, whereas the guitar in my voice felt more like me, me. Oh, yeah. So I think it might actually be like a subjective experience for what brings us maybe in the end to sort of our primary instrument or instruments. Yeah. It's we have certain instruments, certain vibrations, certain feelings that just vibe with us on a different level that yeah. other instruments don't. Like, I yeah. love the piano. I love the piano. But yeah. it does not get me to the same place as singing. And it does not get me to the same place as guitar. Yeah, that's... 
That's very interesting that you brought that up about yourself because I saw you as a singer, actually, because the day that you walked into uh, my little teaching cubicle <laughs> at Green Meadow there and you sang, walked in and you sang every word of, uh, um, uh, what's it called? You know, um, that song that your teacher had just taught you. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I don't remember. Uh, then the Cohen song. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, you you walked in, you just closed the door behind you, and you sang it word for word <laughs> so beautifully. I couldn't believe it. And I said, wow, like, yeah, that's awesome that you can do that. You just learned that in your class, and that you remembered every word, and you sang it so beautifully, uh, right? Uh, so you are a singer, and I, I heard you as a singer on your horn, but with as a guitar player... That the fact that you can back your voice on a guitar, that is really where you're coming from, you know, apart from being a good guitar player, right? But the fact that you can include your voice in that way uh, is, is a beautiful position to be in. If I could sing that well as well as you, I probably would have done that, you know. You make your own decisions, you know, all, all out of your own needs, you know. So after we meet in... Uh... At Green Meadow, like you mentioned, Rockland County, New York, um, yeah. represent. Uh, you start this really incredible gig where you play at the top of the Empire State Building in New York. You were doing it two or three nights a week for, I think, right up until the pandemic. Is that correct? Three nights a week, three hours, three nights a week for 13 years. Wow, 13 years. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, my last gig was, uh, this is almost the, um, where, where are we now? This is the third, right? So in another two weeks, I would have been there uh, 13 years, and I've been home for a whole year now. Right. Wow. Yeah. So what's really cool about this gig is you're not up there with the band. I actually had the privilege of going up with you one time. I met you outside at the bottom of the Empire State Building and you have a pass and all the guys know you and you get to skip all the lines and you go up to the top, that long elevator ride, or two elevator rides, excuse me, yeah. and you get to the top and you basically are up there with your business cards in case anyone wants to know who you are. But other than that, you're on a stool and you're sitting there and you're just playing solo saxophone unaccompanied just creating this romantic atmosphere going on. You've seen people propose, you've played songs people have requested. All the time people come up to you and request songs and because of your ears and your time playing music, you can most of the time just go ahead and play the songs people ask and it's really an incredible gig. So how did you get the call or how does this gig even happen? It's like, um, I don't know. It you know, <laughs> magic happens, and I've had a lot of magic happen in my life. A lot of beautiful things have happened in my life uh, that have allowed me to just do do my music and grow, you know. And that was a growing experience of the highest order because, uh, as as you know, like even the way you just talked about it, you just sit down on the stool and you play solo sax. I'm actually playing tunes. I was playing tunes, uh, uh, standard American songbook tunes, but I was allowed to play anything that I wanted, basically, as long as I was playing. And so I actually mixed it. I, sometimes I would play Jimi Hendrix, and sometimes I would play New York, New York, you know. Uh, so And I would play Happy Birthday for somebody's birthday. And I was exploring, I explored so many tunes uh, in those 13 years that I got deeply inside of um, where I say I could grab a tune, like say Star Eyes, for example, uh, and other meaty tunes like Body and Soul, um, where I could just play, play it. And because I have a rotating crowd, the crowd would be coming in behind me from the elevator and walk and listen to me and then look out the window and go outside and they might come back and listen to some more and then the whole crowd is rotating. 
So it doesn't matter if I keep playing them. You know, I can play a tune for 15 minutes and nobody's going to say, oh, you, but you've been playing the same song, you know. Nobody knows except me, really. And that allowed me to really get into tunes in a deep way. Like, And then the next night I come back, I say, I want to dig a bit further into there, you know, a little bit further. Like a song like I Will Wait For You. Have you ever played that one? It's so beautiful, beautiful, beautiful piece of music. Michel Legrand. And uh, so those kinds of pieces uh, attracted my attention so much that I would dig into them and dig into them. Sometimes I just play blues in 12 keys. I do that too, you know. And um, so anyway, so um, to me, I just saw it as, wow, this is a great opportunity. I am hired to play from May 7th, my wife's birthday. It was the first time I played there. She came and I played and I was, they really liked it. So they said, can you keep coming back? And I said, sure. And so how available are you? You know, and I said, I'm very available. And uh, so they just said, well, can you play all of summer? So this is basically from Memorial Day all the way to Labor Day. Right. But how do you get the call to come do that in the first place? See, that's God's magic. I didn't know. I can't really, I can't, you know, how did I meet Doug Parkinson? And how did I get the score for Stone? And how did, why did I come to San Francisco and find out about uh, Emil de Cosmo? And why did I go, why did I go to, the, uh, uh, to Texas to meet the guy that, no, why did I go to Minneapolis to meet the guy that turned me on to the guy who would get me my green card? The, all these things are like stories that they're, they're huge stories and they're magic. Uh, and it's a little bit to do with, I would say, Morgan and I have had talks about this. My son Morgan and I is that if you believe in what you're doing, uh, you really have to do what you're doing. Uh, you just do it, and then you'll see that somehow you'll be supported, yeah, through serendipity or whatever. But I had the manager call me, and and he said, uh, "I uh, uh, this is Will Green Street," and I said, "Yeah," and and he said, "Well, um, uh, I believe you like to play solo sax." I I should have said to him, "Well, who told you that?" You know, but you don't. You don't say like, "Well, who told you that?" It's wrong. You know, no. So I said, "Oh yeah, I do." You know. And he said, well, how would you like to come up and play for three nights? Wow. Yeah. And I said, on, uh, on the top of the Empire State Building, are you kidding? He said, no, no, no. We'll meet you. Give us a call when you get there. And we'll park you into the parking garage down below. They'll escort you up. They give you a badge. And uh, up you'll go. And we'll, uh, and we'll show you where and all that. So it was just like that. And they really liked it. And let's continue this. So after the three months that, that I did it through the summer, going to Labor Day, they said, well, uh, let's just keep doing this. And I said, okay, doke. So by May of next year, we were doing a contract every year, right? And the contract was a typical contract. You have to give me two weeks' notice, and you can't, you can't take the, your idea of this gig to any other p competing place for two years, right? So they were obviously worried about Top of the Rock or – and." Uh, and the the new towers, you know, that they were building, you know, down south. So anyway, so that was it. And it's been I've been on the contract ever since. And I would probably still be playing there now. I was thinking of, you know, I'd like to play there, you know, for 15 years. I, I played there for 13 years. I'll go to 15 years and make another decision if I want to, if I can keep doing it, you know. Because, you know, in that time, I moved house about three times. Right, and I've lived under all kinds of conditions in the city uh, over the weekend to make it make it work, you know. So, um, but anyway, so that's that's um, that's how it happened. The pandemic happened in March, uh, just right at this time, and I decided that I should take a couple of weeks off. And I was going to call him on Monday and say, "Well, you know, I think it's worse than what I was thinking. I, I think I need to stay off for a while." They beat me to it. They called. They said, we've closed the doors. <laughs> right? It was just like that. So they didn't open until the end of July. 
And even then, you know, they've had to furlough so many people that work there. So yeah, yeah. There's no tourists and there's no restaurants. There's no Broadway. There's no nothing. You know. Yeah. So. In the meantime, you've been practicing a lot, as you do. You you are you are the perennial practicer shedder, like you said. You find these ideas and you like to run with them, discover them. So, do you have a time or times of day that you prefer to practice at? Ah, uh, yes. Um, well, you know, you set your prior. If you sleep, you'll be, you'll get up in the morning. And you work out, you do all that stuff. If you're into meditation, first thing in the morning would be a good time to do that. You know, depending on what you do, right? And so if you're a writer, then maybe uh, you would choose as you get out of bed, you just write down your first thoughts and your journal and you, know, you do that stuff. Uh, I always found that, you know, as soon as I've had breakfast, I want to be in the studio. And mm -hmm. that's my priority and i'll laugh you know because i'm doing two instruments now i do piano and sax and i love starting on the piano because it's gentle <laughs> it's really easy to put your fingers on the keys and uh and and basically i explore the same stuff on the keyboard that i do on the sax so mind you i've been playing the sax since 1981 i've been playing the keyboard now for six years since 2014 so uh i'm in my you know seventh year you could say or six and a half years uh but i try to combine those ideas what makes sense to me so first thing in the morning is it feels really beautiful to play the piano and i have a whole routine that i do there and then i will can so you break that routine down for us can you tell us maybe not exactly what you're practicing but Maybe how you're segmenting that time on the piano. Right. Okay. So to understand uh, how I think is uh, I never do anything that's out of reach. I, you know, I push myself, but I, I'm practicing stuff on the piano that makes sense. So in other words, I believe in kindergarten before grade school and then grade school before high school, and high school before college, and then the real world. So I've always treated my students that way, too, that uh, I treat myself as if I am a student of the piano, you see. So and I understand that there's a lot of things on the sax that I can rip through that I cannot do on the piano. And the reason why is because I haven't don't have the years behind me of doing that. So on the piano, uh, I say uh, I'm and on the sax, I do this thing where I've been doing this for quite a while now. It's to do with keys, right? You're dealing with keys and cycles, you could say. So the cycle that I go through on both instruments is uh, uh, the key of C. And I, if I do the key of C on piano, I do the key of my C on the sax, which is really rings as E flat, right? Right. So, but I do, I, whatever I experience on the piano, I'm going to experience on the sax as that key. I go through the cycle in this manner. And then the next day, I will, um, one sharp. And then the next day after that, I will do one flat. And then I will do two sharps. And then I will do two flats. And then three sharps. And then three flats. So I started doing that as a daily thing quite a long time ago. And now, uh, no, and then I went to, well, I need about four days in each key. So that's what I was doing, four days in the key of C uh, on the piano and then on the sax. And then I need uh, the four days uh, in the key of G and then four days in the key of one flat, F, you know. Et cetera, et cetera. Right. So now it's come down. This year I started doing a whole week in a key. So I spent a whole week in a key on both instruments. Right. And, you know, so then I have more leisure time. In other words, I can get through all the rigmarole of everything I want to go through. And then I have some open time where I play some tunes and I actually really uh, explore that key even more. So, and to be clear, when you're saying the key of C, you're not just talking about key of C. You're also talking about the uh, 
the relative minor, uh, which would be uh, A minor. You're also talking about going through the modes of C, correct? You're not just doing C and then leaving everything else out. Well, you know, uh, years ago I did modes and I did collections of scales and all that stuff. You know, there, you know, there are there's a mode. Of course, there's a, modes of any scale. You can have seven modes of any seven note scale. <clears throat> What I brought it down to is the most important sounds are contained within the blues progression as the way Charlie Parker would play it, which is the fast progression. Fast changes, they call it in jazz. So contained, contained in fast changes blues, according to Charlie Parker, uh, is all the sounds that I need for what I'm doing, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? No, I'm not. Okay, so the blues uh, is one, four, five, right? Yeah. So in other words, if you're doing a blues in C, uh, you would have a C and then you would have an F and you would have a G. Correct. And, and those sounds, right? Yeah. So um, the way Charlie Parker would do it is he would play a series of chords before he reached the four chord. Ah, yes, I see. So... Coming at, coming at the blues from a jazz perspective, where you're using half step leading chords, you're also right. using uh, tritone substitutions, especially right. in the last. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, we're on the same page. Yeah, so all the information is contained in that. If anybody is interested, they should check out um, Confirmation, Charlie Parker. So all those chords that are contained in that. song it actually is great it, but it has all those fast changes and charlie parker in his omni book and he has a second omni book now he doesn't but somebody put it out uh, there's even more of these fast changes blues progressions that are really worth checking out because it takes you into okay how do you deal with you have c and then you have b minus seven five five going to e right so and then you have a minor going to going to uh, to D going to you know A minor going A minor to D and then D minor to G and then you know it's like these chord the chord progression that takes you to the four chord um, uh, has so much information in it and you have to play the right sounds on all those chords you have to get the chords voiced right and you have to play the the, the sounds on them correctly right. So, and I have to tell you, I also uh, have gotten into into playing rootless chords, which is my wife got me into this. My wife, Cat Greenstreet, who is a bass player, and <clears throat> we've been playing standards together, you know, and we've been playing music together as long as I've known her, which is 35 years. And we regularly play standards where she plays bass and walks it beautifully, and we play some hard tunes. And one day, you know, I've been playing the piano. You know, we got the piano and I've been playing for a couple of years. And she said to me one night, we're playing. She said, get off my notes. <laughs> you know, I swear, you know, as only a wife could say to you, you know, nobody in the band would ever say that. But anyway, she's the bass player. And, and I'm saying, I don't know what you mean. She said, you know, like when I hit an F chord and you're hitting an F in the bass and then I hit a B flat. And you're hitting a B flat in the bass. I hit an E flat. You're hitting an E flat in the bass. Get off my notes. They're my notes. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know. I've learned my chords this way from the root, you know. So to be clear, in this case, you're playing the piano. She's playing the bass, which is why you're getting those bass notes. Is you're actually doubling her bass notes in the left yeah. hand while right. you're playing triads and four and uh, four note chords in the right Whatever hand. Whatever else is left in the chord and I'm right. playing and all that stuff oh, right. right hand excuse me that's how i that's how i started on the piano see i'm self-taught all the way around you know right so uh, and so i said i don't know how to do it she said well you know find out how to do it get away from and so i started asking jazz piano players and i googled it too and i found on youtube people were explaining how you do it and i had a, a good friend in australia He's a sax player who also was an arranger. And he said, really, what you do is you play rootless chords. And so instead of playing one, three, five for a chord, one, three, five, seven, nine, you actually leave that root note out there. So you put 
you put that seven underneath, and then the next your next note is is the uh, the three. The, I'm sorry, the nine, right? So you put the you put the seven on the bottom, then your nine, and then your three, and then your five. So yeah, and, seven, nine, three, five. And there's an amazing book by Mark Levin. Mark so, Levin has an amazing piano sorry, book you're on this cutting. stuff. Oh, I was saying Mark Who Levin. Does? Mark Levin has an amazing oh, piano yeah. book. Yeah, 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 yes. I, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, anyway, so that to me was a, a, a revelation, you know, because the information around that, because we know that if any, uh, you have all these inversions that you can do on the piano, which, you know, as a sax player, you don't think about that a whole lot because you have the whole scale. You can come from anywhere. You know, you can be anywhere and come from anywhere, you know. But on the piano, you really like, okay, you need to make decisions about where your chord is sitting and what it leads to, how one note leads to another, leading tones in chords, you know. So, and I found, I've just concentrated in all this time since discovering these rootless chords of all the categories, you know, uh, I've been concentrating on the on the one that has the seventh in the bottom and the one that has yeah. the third in the bottom. The ones in between, the one that has the two in the bottom uh, and the one that has the, uh, let me see, the five in the bottom, uh, they're more crunchy kind of chords. And I've used them, I use them as passing, but I don't concentrate on them. I do those two and that's enough. That is so much information. <laughs> There's so much information, and maybe if I grow to the point where I go, okay, I'm ready to move on, you know, being in control of my own study steps, uh, uh, then I will take it on. But right now, I still feel like it's plenty. Uh, my favorite is really having the third in the bottom. That, those are beautiful sounding chords, you know. You know, one, one, uh, <clears throat> one, six, flat, seven, nine. As a seventh chord, ah, oh, it's beautiful. Mm. So another C, you, I could see you visualizing that. Do you do that on guitar? No, but what you're talking about doing on the piano, putting going like seven, nine, three, five, uh, is absolutely my favorite way to approach playing uh, seventh chords on the piano is doing that seven, nine, three, five thing. Because then you get these little combinations where your hands are like this, or like this, yeah. and it just feels so good, and it sounds so nice. Right, that's the beautiful, that beautiful little dissonance, the six yes. and the flat seven. That's beautiful, right? Yeah. And when you do the altered sound and all that stuff, yep. and those chords, you know, they re they've really stayed with me. I've used them in all my compositions since I discovered this stuff. You know, which I could never have done as just as a sax player, mm. right? So it's one of the things that I was. Uh, practicing at ESB on the 86th floor that I would put rootless chords into every song because I was practicing it on the on the sax too, you see. And I spell everything out without the root sitting in there. And I'm already on the 86th floor. I'm 1,050 feet up from the ground and I'm playing rootless chords and people are going like dreaming when they listen to me. You know, they're saying, what? what are you playing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I have to throw melodies in there and every now and again hit a good root note so that to ground them, you know. But basically I was very comfortable with it. And I find that that solved this problem with my wife and myself. And uh, the wife is happy that I do rootless chords. <laughs> She's really happy about that because it gives her all that space, you know. The roots have to be the bass player, you know. It's not that you can't play roots, you know. It's but every now and again, when you do, it's very impressive that you actually hit that root note. But but basically, you leave that area alone. It's her department, you know. It's and it sounds more orchestral that way. Yeah, I, I think having that sort of consciousness of if you're playing the piano with a bass player, you let the bass player play the bass stuff. Then if you're yeah. playing guitar with a piano player and a mm. bass player then mm. basically you're just going to hang out on thirds and sevenths, do little chunky James Brownie palm muted things. You just stay out of the way. You you yeah. just, it's, it's, it's small stuff. It's just about adding in a little color here and there because it's all about just working in where you're going to fit in this conversation. Right. Yeah, Dan. And it's basically also about your relationship with the piano player. Do you have, 
do you understand each other that he needs some space to play? Yeah. Uh, you can just put your hands down and just yeah. listen to him, you know? Yeah. And if you can do that and he can do that too, you know, I was always so impressed with McCoy Tyner Quartet where McCoy would just stop playing, you know? And sometimes Jimmy Garrison would stop playing and just let Elvin and train loose, you know? It's beautiful. And then when they come in, like just tastefully something, it's so amazing, right? Absolutely. Like, you know, you know the tune Countdown? Yes, I don't yeah. think I can. I I know I know it. I can't hear it in my head right now though. Okay, yeah. yeah. Right, no, no, no more. We have to pay for copyright. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so what 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 that is? It's a very complicated piece of music of Coltrane's, where basically he's playing through three turnarounds, two five ones, but in in his own altered way. In, in in other words, he's putting in five chords before he hits the next chord. Right. All right. Yeah. And he's playing at a breakneck speed. It's like ridiculous. He's so talented. When I first heard this piece of music back in San Francisco, I thought, wow, these guys can really play free. He was not playing free. It was very organized. And so anyway, but that piece, the reason why I'm telling you is what he did there was he starts out with the drummer. The drummer just plays and then Coltrane comes in and he plays about mm, maybe 10 choruses with the drummer, right? And you go, wow, this is amazing, right? And then you hear McCoy hitting some chords and you go, wow, there's chords to this piece of music. And then for the last chorus, in comes Jimmy Garrison. And I'm not sure if it's Elvin Jones on that. I think it's, uh, what do they call him? AJ or uh, Anyway, uh, they come in, they just come in to end it, right? So he was putting it to exercise. Can we do this just as, you know, sax and drums, and then you guys come in, you know, you can talk about this stuff. It's an arrangement, right? Speaking of uh, coming in to end it, Will, I could talk to you all day, every day. <laughs> For like a couple months, and I feel like we could just we could just shoot the musical stuff back and forth. But uh, we've been going at this for a little over two hours now, so I'm I'm thinking we should probably wrap it up. Oh, I thought this was going to be a ninety minute thing. Uh, you know what? Here we are. Here we are. Will, thank you well, so so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, links to your Facebook and everything, uh, including your book. Um, are in the description below. Everyone go check it out. If you're listening on audio, it's in the show notes. Will Greenstreet, a.k.a. Billy Green from back in the day, thank you so much for coming on. Dan, thank you so much for inviting me. It was a great pleasure.